Hello ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do 2.1 and 2.2 today. We're going to be talking about mostly review, but we're going to be doing the limit definition of a derivative, basic differentiation rules, and you can see the ones we're going to do today, and then rates of change and average velocity. So yes, I know you're brilliant, and yes, I know you remember this stuff, but we're going to go back over it just in case anyway. So the first thing I want to do is I want to revisit the tangent line problem. And I know that you guys know all of this information, but sometimes it's just nice to see it again and go, oh yeah, I, I understand that. And thank you guys for being patient with me. So here it's going to have a curve of some random little function, right? And it's going to be in terms of x. And I'm going to have a point on that function. And I'm going to want to find the tangent line to my function through that point. So this is going to be the tangent line. Okay. So if you remember, the first thing that we do when we start the tangent problem is we start talking about the secant. So I could pick a point on this side, and we're going to say that that point has coordinates of c and f of c. And then I could pick a point over here, and this point I'm going to move over in x, so I'm going to have a delta x because the x has changed, it's gotten bigger. So this coordinate is c plus delta x, so that means that the y coordinate is f of c plus delta x, okay? And so those would be the coordinates. Well then, I can draw my secant line through those two points. So the way that the tangent line problems work is we think about delta x. And if we think about delta x getting smaller and smaller and drawing those secant lines and then getting smaller and smaller, what ends up happening is the secant line actually becomes parallel to the tangent line, which is really nice. So then, if I want to talk about what happens as I get progressively closer and closer and closer, then I can talk about the limit of the function, okay, as delta x goes to zero, but I want to talk about the slope, and the slope is, and I'll write it up here, sorry, slope is delta y over delta x, so my y's are changing and so are my x's, and this is going to become the slope of the tangent, so I'm going to call it m tangent. Well, to accommodate those points getting closer and closer and closer, I take the limit of the slope, so it's going to be the change in the y's, so it would be, this is y2, this is y1, it would be c plus delta x, take away the original, oops, that's a c, take away the original, and then I'm going to divide it by the change in x, which right here we've just listed as delta x. And if you'll remember from Algebra 1, this has become our formal definition of a derivative. And sometimes they say it is the limit definition of a derivative, but as I consider my tangent line and my secant line, I'm going to take the limit and find the slope. And the reason that I take the limit is because I want to show what happens as x approaches 0, meaning that the delta x virtually goes away. And I'm considering what happens at the given point. All right. So there's a couple of things that we need to remember when we're using the formal de definition the formal definition of our derivative. I'm sorry, I still have a cold, so I sound like a frog. One, when we take the limit, we are finding the slope of the tangent to the curve at a given point C. And C could be anywhere along the x-axis, okay? All right, and then we would have its f of C. 
the other thing that we have to really pay attention to is that pesky indeterminate form. And remember that our indeterminate form happens when I take a limit, so say as, oops, and you can't see it, my bad, as delta x goes to zero, and when I do all of my algebra, maybe, or when I do my direct substitution, I might get infinity over infinity, or I get a zero over zero, or I get something over zero. And we know that that's the indeterminate form, and we have to resolve our indeterminate form, and typically we do it with algebra. And if you'll remember from last year, sometimes it gets to be fairly tedious. So you just have to be very careful, especially as you're expanding your binomials. And I'm going to do an example later where I use the solved triangle, but we'll talk about it in just a bit. Remember that there are also several different ways I can notate a derivative. So remember that I can write y prime. I could also write the derivative of the function with respect to x. I could also write the derivative of y with respect to x. Or I could do the formal definition, the limit as delta x goes to 0, of f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. And remember, this is just my slope calculation. All right, so now let's do the example. Let me put my paper back down. And I'm going to walk you back through using Pascal's triangle, because sometimes we forget those little details. So I'm going to tell you that the function is equal to x cubed plus 2x. And I want you to find the derivative using the formal definition. Remember, those words can look different things at different times. Or I can use the limit definition of a derivative, so they say it different ways. So remember that my derivative, dy dx, is going to be the limit as delta x approaches 0, so as the change in x gets infinitesimally closer to 0, it's going to be the slope x plus that delta x minus the original f of x, so that's my y, change in the y, over the change in the x. So now remember that I have to take these values and substitute it into the original function. And remember that annoying, pesky thing that you have to carry your limit notation throughout the problem. So then if I rewrite it, this is going to become x plus delta x quantity cubed plus 2 times x plus delta x minus the original function plus 2x all over delta x. So if you'll remember when I cube a binomial, if I use the false triangle, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, right? This is what I use if I'm at a third degree. Remember that the first variable is decreasing in power. The second variable is going up in power, and these are my constants. Sorry, these are the coefficients. So then if I keep going, as x approaches 0, this is going to be x to the third, remember his coefficient is 1, plus, and then he goes down, coefficient is 3, x squared delta x to the 1, plus 3x to the 1 delta x squared, plus 1 delta x cubed. Okay, whoo, that was the binomial. Now I expand this guy, 2x plus 2 delta x minus x cubed minus 2x all over delta x. Okay? And then you notice, and if you remember, lots of stuff typically ends up canceling. So my x cubes go away. That's nice. My 2x's go away. Um, and that's it. Delta x in the denominator is the problem child. So now what I'm going to attempt to do is factor a delta x out of all of the things that are left. So I write the limit as delta x goes to 0. I'm going to factor out the de delta x, and I'm going to get 3x squared plus 3x delta x plus delta x squared plus 2, I think that's the end, over delta x. Those guys cancel. Yeehaw. Right? 
now I'm ready to do my direct substitution because the indeterminate form has gone away. This guy's going to go to zero. This guy's going to go to zero. And remember, it's polite to show what's going away. And so what I have left is 3x squared plus 2. So I write 3x squared plus 2. And then I write my statement at the bottom just to clean my workup of f of x is 3x squared plus 2. Ta-da! All right, so that wasn't so horrible. And remember, this is a generic formula that will help me calculate. So I could use to calculate the slope of the tangent to the curve. Ooh, I'm writing bad. To the curve at any point along the curve. Okay, so it is a handy dandy formula that will help me calculate the slope anywhere along the curve. All right, just a couple of little details to talk about. For a derivative to exist, so before I can have a derivative, I have to know that the limit as x approaches c exists, right? And then I also have to have no sharp points in my graph. And I like to talk about this with our absolute value graph because it's just the coolest thing to think about. So here is my handy dandy absolute value graph, right? Here's my little guy. And I think about the slope. So if I drew a tangent, the slope would be negative. Okay, so if I took the limit of the function as x approaches 0 from the left, my slope is negative. Okay, then if I talk about the limit of the function as x approaches 0 from the right, okay, the slope of this guy is positive. Well, the limits don't agree. Therefore, I can't take the derivative at 0. I could take the derivative anyplace else. And if I took the derivative, say, over here, I would have to turn my absolute value function into a piecewise and only take the derivative of, say, the left or the right-hand piece. All righty. Um, remember that if I'm going to write an equation, sorry, an equation for the tangent line, so not just finding the slope, but if I want to actually write an equation for the tangent line, then I use my derivative, oops, I spelled it wrong, to give me the slope. And then I use the point-slope formula, because it's the fastest way to write an equation for a line. And that is y minus y1 is m. And this would be my derivative slope times x minus x1. And then when I'm done, I would put that formula into slope-intercept form to report. But remember, when you report, you need to write y tangent so that they know, man, I'm having issues getting it where you can see it. They need to know that that's the equation of the tangent line. So you always want to identify your answers well. All right, that's it for 2-1. Didn't seem like we went through that that fast last year, right? So 2-2, two, two, we're going to talk more about some derivative rules. So these are just going to be some derivative rules just to refresh the brain. The first one is the constant rule. And if you'll remember, if I take the derivative of a constant, I get 0. And if you think about, if I have y is equal to a constant, then I have a horizontal line. Well, the slope of the horizontal line is 0, which means that the slope of the tangent is also 0, which is why the derivative of a constant is 0. That's kind of cool. The next one is our power rule, and I hate it when people sniff, so I'm sorry. So I have d over dx of x to the n. So if you remember, I take that n out front, and I subtract 1, and there we go. Okay, the next one would be our constant multiple. Okay, and that one would be if I take the derivative of a constant out in front of some function, 
key is just like when we do logs, gets to go out front. So then I'm going to have the constant times the derivative of the function. Okay? And then sometimes we like to combine, we do all kinds of crazy crap in calculus, but I'm going to combine the power and the constant. So what if you were asked to take a derivative, ooh, paper's crooked, of a constant, a constant times something raised to a power? Well, the constant chills out front, and then the n comes down, and then I do x to the n minus 1. So that's pretty easy. Um, sum and difference rules. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Sum and difference. Whew, that was tough. Remember if I take the derivative of one function add or added or subtracted to another function, to make my life easier, I can just split up the functions and I could take the derivative of the first function and add or sub subtract it to the derivative of the second function. So remember, we have lots of tricks, since I've said that a lot, I'm sorry, we have lots of tricks to help us solve our derivatives. There's a couple of special ones that we want to talk about. And we're just going to start introducing some of our trig derivatives. Because remember, they have, I said it again, my bad. If I take the derivative of the sine of x, I get the cosine of x. And if I take, I'll do it over here so you can see it, the derivative of the cosine of x, I get a negative sine of x. And amazingly, we are just about done with the first two sections of derivatives. Okay, the last portion of this section talks about the position function. Okay? And we call that, if you'll remember, <laughs> sorry, S, and it talks about the position of an object with respect to the origin. And if I want to talk about the change in something's position, then if I do delta, delta S, well, then it's just going to be the slope of my S minus the original S, change in position, over my change in time. Okay? So then I can call, if I need to calculate a rate, it is distance divided by time. And I could say that average velocity is going to be the change in distance divided by the change in time. And if you'll look at what we have here, this is going to be the new y value. This is the original y value, or the y value at the point t, divided by the change of x. So this is still just going to be delta y over delta x. We're still just calculating slope. And then we would write this as delta S over delta T. All right, that's it.